Peter Rose, Long Week Currency Trading. Good morning. It's the um, uh, first week of uh, August of uh, 2021. Actually, uh, this will be published the second week of August. But the um, topic that I want to cover today is defining the Forex problem domain. And problem domain is a term that we use in software engineering. We don't use it. I use it because I spent a I had a 33-year career as a senior software engineer. And problem domain and an object-oriented analysis of any system that you're going to model or, or, or create, problem domain is a critical uh, component of that analysis process, and it restricts your view of that. So I'd like to, to, to share with you the importance of the concepts of problem domains in software engineering as it could apply to us as traders within the context of the Forex foreign currency market. But first, well, I got my coffee first, so I don't have to waste your time with that. But I am going to hobble on out to the porch. It's a beautiful uh, sunny day out, and so uh, you can be out there in the sun with me. See you there in a minute. I'm not going to carry you out there with me. Well, I thought I'd spare you the um, walk out and the B-roll of me sitting down and all that crap. The Forex market itself is a system. A system is stuff going on, just like a racetrack is a system. It's got cars running around, it's got spectators and, you know, all that other kind of stuff. So, <clears throat> if you're going to understand the complexity of a system, you have to know what the individual parts are that comprise that system. And so if a part doesn't have anything to do with that system, then there's really no reason to consider that in your analysis of that system, right? I mean, I hope that makes sense. Let me raise this up a little bit. I don't know if you're catching all of me here. Oop, that rocked it around. Good. Great. Great filming, Peter. Um, if I was um, if I was talking about a car, I wouldn't necessarily bring into my analysis um, wind coefficients of a sail because you're not going to put a mizzen sail <laughs> on a car for racing or whatever, right? Um, so when we look at systems of, of things and we're going to do some analysis over that we talk about defining the problem domain of that system and then staying within that that context. For example, if my system that I was going to, going to design was a um, car registration system for a municipality, you know, you got to come in and register your car with the town. And I got to working on that and I said, oh gee, uh, you know, the town also has boat registrations, and you need a hull ID to register a boat. So when I'm looking at building my information screen, I should put a hull ID number on there. Well, wait a minute. There are other considerations about boats that really aren't considering with a car. I mean, is this, uh, uh, does the boat have a motor? Does it have... So if my job was to design a car registration system for the city of East Overshoe, New York, and I came to them with a, 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 a module for boat registration, they'd say, well, first of all, we don't have any boats because we don't have any water around here. So you, we're not going to pay you for the time that you did that. Second of all, you got all this shit intermixed with the uh, car registration stuff, we can't even use the systems, so we're not going to pay you for any of that, and in fact, you're fired, <laughs> because you're out of scope of what the problem domain is. And if I was writing that task to write that car registration system, and I really didn't know much about cars or, or registering laws, and I got distracted by adding in the complexities of boat registration or, hey, how about voter registration to top that off? Um, it would be just a mess. And needless to say, the car registration component, if I was ever to get around to writing that, would be 
such a mess for a user to be able to um, take advantage of it and, and register the car online. Uh, they just come down and, and, and want to do it in person. And so when we're getting to the point where we're looking seriously at trading, I mean, this is if you're, I mean, if you're watching the guys on, on YouTube driving their fancy cars around and you're impressed with all the money that they made, yeah, maybe they did make $10 million. What fucking difference does that make if they can't teach you how to do it? And the fact that they made it doesn't mean that they can necessarily teach. I've said this gazillions of times. And I'll guarantee you that 99% of them can't teach. I can teach because I know stuff <laughs> like what I try to bring to the table uh, in, in, uh, in my talking about the currency markets from my experiences in software engineering, application development, my degree in physics, and my 40-year career as a, a real estate investor. All of these things comprise the same types of components that you need to understand in order to understand the whole thing, right? So if you were going to build that car registration system, you would want to put it in a very strict box of stuff that you'd put on the screen, the stuff that you'd work on, because you'd want to deliver this functioning unit to the city. And then let the city say, well, now we need a voter registration. Oh, okay, how can I take this great framework that I've built for a vehicle registration and, ex and extend that? Remember, I've talked before in other videos about the extensibility of your frameworks. And if so if you build that car registration system, it should be very extensible to create um, another module that would deal with boat registration. The neat thing is that probably 80% of the data that I've collected for my car registration system is going to be applicable to the boat registration. So I can create a separate module for boat registration and a module for car registration and I create another module up here that's now for um, municipal uh, property registration and that would have all of that common information and your name and your address and phone number and all that shit which is going to be needed for the car registration as well as the boat registration that will be stored up above in this main module and that one would say well do you want to register your car and that would bring up this screen do you want to register your boat and it would bring up that screen that's your how that's how you build extensible systems but it begins with one system with a very strict and very specific problem domain. What's the problem I'm trying to solve? I'm trying to solve registering a car. That's it. I don't give a shit about your dog or your boat or anything else. Or what hours the <laughs> town hall is open or, or any of that. It's car registration. Just do that. If you're going to trade Forex... You just trade Forex. Don't be mixing in there oil and the Bund and, and the S&P or, or wheat futures. <clears throat> Learn how to trade one thing. If you're not interested in currencies, but everybody's telling you how much money you can make in currencies, don't do currencies. Obviously, you don't know enough about what's going on to make the decision on your own. Because nobody's presenting you the absolute problem domain of what the foreign currency market is. They're telling you, oh, you can do all this stuff and you can trade corn and you can trade the S&P because it's all the same. It's not the same. Now, there are 80% of the things that you do or 90% of the things that you do in currency trading that are applicable to trading wheat or, or spaghetti or old tires or whatever you want to do. But as a trader starting out with less than a few years of currency trading, you better just stick to one thing. And that's why in this channel, it's only the foreign currency market. And guess what? The name of my company, Longwood Currency Trading. It's only about currency. So if you come here, you're coming here to learn about how to trade 
foreign currencies, not old tires or spaghetti or stocks or commodities or whatever, or real estate. I had a 40 year career as a re uh, in, in real estate. I bring to bear some of the generic principles of real estate into the currency trading, but it's not about real estate, it's about currency trading. And as you, if you've watched some of my other videos, you know that there's a time differential in actions that you can take in real estate that is not applicable to currency trading and there's stuff in currency trading that's not applicable to the real estate market. You know, there's some general stuff that goes up in this guy here and then there's stuff that's in the real estate market bucket that's here and stuff that's in the currency market that's here. But all we want to think about is the currency market, the foreign currency market. What is the problem domain of the foreign currency market? What creates the currency market? What data, I guess, is, is, is what we're asking ourselves. What data is it? Well, let's abstract out to the, to the large picture of thing. The, the primary mover of data is a country. And you have two pair countries and have different economies and different ideologies and politics and sociology and all that other kind of stuff <clears throat> that change over time. But that's the root of it. It, it's one country trying to trying to conduct economic trade with another country. That's the problem domain at, at a very high level. So then you look at well, what are the common characteristics of countries of of data that you would really need to know? Are they? trend lines? Are they uh, head and shoulders patterns? Are they, what, you know, what are they? Um, there are things that are inherent that determine the value of that country's currency. What could one of those things be? Well, interest rates, right? Because as interest rates go up, it makes that particular currency of that country more desirable because you get a better return on on your money so so that's one thing that's kind of important and isn't interest rates kind of the predominant dog in 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 a country's economy isn't that what everybody worries about you have consumer price index that's important um and the health of the stock market but but those are all really dependent on the on the interest rate what do i have to pay for my for my money what what is that because it's the cost of money that determines whether I'm going to be able to buy a house whether I'm going to be able to I mean sure you can have as we have in the United States today really low interest rates for mortgages but the prices have, have exploded beyond the reach of of most people and so you could have zero financing and nobody be able to Nobody would be able to buy it. you borrow all the money in the world, but you still couldn't buy it because you couldn't afford it. Just a fact. I mean, that's how we got into all that trouble in the 2008 uh, mortgage crisis, right? You had these dumbass uh, mortgage lenders and banks, and they were all in collusion with each other. We, 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 we got to get our money out there. But, you know, the interest rates are low. So we got to get our money out there. We got to compete for that money. We got to compete for people to borrow the money. They're going to borrow the money uh, from us, and uh, you know we're going to charge them um, four percent because uh, we can only get two percent in the interbank market. And we got to get our money out there. So we got to get these mortgages out there. So you give some dumbass making forty thousand dollars a year access to a five hundred thousand dollar house. He's going to take it because he doesn't know any better. But then when he loses his job or his hours get cut back, they're living paycheck to paycheck, he can't make his mortgage. And everybody, that happened to everybody. And so boom, down all that goes. It was all about those interest rates. The interest rates created the availability of the money that allowed people to, to do something. Foolish, perhaps. So that's why you see uh, a country will lock their interest rates uh, and, and uh, lock them up and start raising them to make it less profitable for someone 
to borrow? Why would I be eager to buy a house if the interest rates were back at 10%? When I started in real estate, I remember saying to anybody that was around, if I can get 10% money, I'd borrow all day long. You're probably looking at me like, what are you fucking stupid? 10% money? You haven't lived long enough to know what uh, a standard 8, 10% money for your property, buying a house, a residential house at 12%. Now, the prices of the houses back then were appreciating so rapidly that yeah, you, you'd have a mortgage that was costing you a lot of money, but the house would appreciate so much that you could then pay off that mortgage, which was really what wasn't really that much. I mean, I bought my, um, I bought a house, uh, for example, for um, oh god, what was it, uh, twenty four thousand dollars, something like that. And I bought a four unit apartment building for thirty five thousand dollars one time. Um, so as the property appreciates in value more, you borrow more against it, use that money to buy something else, and and all, but it's all based on what's the money going to cost me? And that, that theme is going through each country's politics and their population. So that's a key element. So our problem domain is to say we're talking about the economies of countries and one of the major factors, I'm not going to go over all of them, one of the major factors is interest rate movement. That has to be considered when we're looking at determining if the pricing of a currency pair is correct or not. If you have a, a pair like, let's say, pound dollar, and the interest rates are increasing, which means the pound should be getting stronger, um, but all of a sudden you see the pound falling against the dollar, you have to ask yourself, <clears throat> is the pound falling because of interest rate issues or is the dollar simply rising dramatically against that? And if that's the case, are they raising their interest rates more than the pound is? Or what other factor is involved? Now, you don't have to be an economic wizard um, with an MBA in order to trade foreign currencies, particularly if you're a day trader as I am. And that's one of the reasons I'm a day trader because I don't want to have to deal with those long-term fundamental problems that I had to deal with when I was tra de dealing in uh, real estate investment. You don't buy a piece of property for uh, uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, thinking that in two weeks you, 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 might, you might want to flip it, <laughs> you know, or in two years. I mean, that's just craziness. So, uh, excuse me, back is sore this morning. Thinking about this stuff makes my head hurt. If you're trading on a long-term basis, you need to become more familiar with the more esoteric aspects of fundamental analysis and the aspects of some of the technical analysis become a little bit more um, applicable. What that does require, though, is a tremendous amount more of knowledge about what the fundamentals are in two countries, not just one, and also a very detailed analysis of technical analysis. You know, if you want to know about technical analysis, go back to the old days. Edwards and McGee wrote a tremendous book on technical analysis. A newer book, Ed Ponzi wrote a book on technical analysis. He's a Forex trader. You might want to t check out his book. Um, regardless, technical analysis is not just, oh, uh, you pick the peaks here and you draw this uh, resistance line and you draw this line here and price bounces between them and the buy, buy low, sell high. You know, I like that really neat book that was written called Buy Low, Sell High, Collect Early, and Pay Late. It isn't quite that simple. Um, technical analysis really has nothing to do with drawing trend lines or head and shoulders patterns or whatever. Technical analysis is simply a shorthand notation of something that happened economically. 
if all you do is know that a squiggle, uh, what, uh, what a, oh, I see a flag pattern. I see a pin bar. I see an engulfing candle pattern. That means nothing unless you have the underlying understanding of the economics behind what's causing that pattern to manifest itself. Because if you don't, then you will misinterpret that pattern. If you look at any of these guys that are out there that are showing their charts and they're using technical analysis, they'll say, see, here was this pin bar and that's why I'm going to go, um, I'm going to go long. And if you look back on that chart, if they show you far enough back on that chart, there'll be pin bars all through that. But they didn't pick those. Not because they didn't work, it was because there wasn't the same confluence of information for this pin bar that there was here. There wasn't that same confluence at some of the other examples of pin bars that you can easily see on that chart that the guy didn't pick. But if you're not smart, if you didn't do your work and you're just letting some dumbass tell you, oh, I've got a fucking pin bar here, so you ought to go long, you're not going to know how to apply that. Because when he shows it on the chart on the, or on the screen and you're watching the video, oh, yeah, I see that. That makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense because he told you what it was and he and, 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 and has a lot more information than you do to say it's valid. You turn the YouTube video off and you go to your thing and you go, oh, there's a pin bar. I'm going to go long or I'm going to go short or whatever you're going to do. And you wonder why it doesn't work. And that's why... I do my trading on a short-term day trading basis because I don't have to know any, any of that stuff. I don't have to know any of it. All I have to do is be aware of it. And the more that you trade, the more you'll pick out of it. It's like gardening. I don't know anything about gardening. You don't have to know anything about gardening. You dig a hole, you put the fucking plant in. You know? And, you know, the plant dies. Why did it die? Oh, I, oh, I got to water. Oh, okay, I got to water. I put, I put that plant. Then I put another plant in. And it kills this plant. Oh, I didn't know you couldn't put that plant in with this plant. So you go through. Or you say, well, maybe I ought to read a book about gardening. What, how often do I have to water? What sorts of plants won't cohabitate well together? And so you learn that. But you got to be willing to make some mistakes in the beginning to bring out what you need to look at to learn. You can't just open a dictionary and learn how to speak English if you're not a fluent English speaker. That doesn't make any sense. But that's the way most educators are teaching this stuff. And that's why I'm telling you, it's so critical for you to understand how to identify what the Forex market problem domain is so that you don't extrapolate your studies out to shit that, it, that doesn't matter and doesn't count. And so what I'm telling you is, Fundamental analysis and technical analysis doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Learn how to trade price action and learn it on a short-term chart. Once you learn the basic principles and you learn exactly what it is you need to know because you've learned what not to do with short money, once you get a good win-to-loss ratio, then you can go out and trade on an hour chart or a, a day chart or something like that and be successful at it. But you probably won't be as successful as you should be <coughs> trading up on those uh, long period charts because you're not being given the opportunity to fail enough. If you trade up on the daily chart, when, how, how often are you trading? You're not trading daily. If you're trading the daily chart, you're trading, you might, you might complete a trade in a week, but it'd be more like two weeks. You got, you got to give it that runway. You got to give it that time to mature. You're not trading on a daily chart to make 20 pips. You fucking crazy. If you're going on a daily chart with an ATR of 100 pips, you better be looking for a 300 pip return or you're, 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 you're not satisfying stuff. But if you're looking for a 300 pip return, you better be willing to take 150 pip risk. How many times are you going to be able to do that with your short stock bank? Not very many. And yet, what do all 99.9% of the so-called educators out there, what are they showing you? They're showing you carry trades. Over the weekend, three-day trades, two-week trades. Oh, look, I made 300 pips. Great, you made that because you're experienced. Are you going to be able to make that? Even as a, as a couple of year trader, are you going to be able to do that? Are you going to be able to make that transition? If you don't 
figure out the stuff that you really need to know by doing it a lot of times down on the lower time frames, are you really going to be able to figure that out in real time where it counts up on the long-term charts? Because your problem domain changes. Oh, so it isn't just about the two countries. Now an important characteristic of the problem domain of the Forex market is what time frame are you going to trade on? And you can't say, well, I'm going to trade on the 15 minute and then next week I'll trade on the, on the, on the weekly. Uh -uh. Doesn't work that way. So you got to pick a time frame. That's part of your problem domain. So if you're building your uh, trading plan um, or your methodology, which is embedded within the trading plan, and the methodology consists of your strategic approach to your trading as well as the tactical implementation of the strategies, that's all part of that trading plan, which you probably don't have, but you should. Or some dumbass just showed you some stupid outline. I'm going to trade between 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. pound dollar and... Uh, I'm going to look for head and shoulders patterns on Tuesdays. I mean, I don't, I don't know what the hell you're doing. What's the problem domain? What, what information? How do, you, how do you reduce all the clutter that's out there, all the information that's out there? How do you reduce that to the point where you've got manageable components that you can actually deal with? And I've said many times, if you have five objects you have 325 different permutations you can arrange those objects in. If I have two objects, there's four uh, permutations, right? You have object A and you have object B. So I can have A or I can have just B or I can have AB or I can have BA. You have four permutations for two objects. You have 325 permutations for just five objects. So when you're looking at your problem domain to define what you want to do, if you've got five things that you're looking at, you've got 325 different permutations that you could put that shit into. And if you don't know what the fuck you're doing or you're not organized or you haven't thought this stuff through, how could you possibly be successful? How can you possibly be successful listening to the information that you're getting on YouTube videos by these people that don't know how to teach? And you don't need, you need a mentor so that you can kind of ride on their backs and learn from their mistakes so that you can find your way down the path behind them as they're shining the light for you. I'd highly recommend that you, that you do that. I didn't have a mentor when I started. It cost me uh, $50,000. And I was very successful in the... Um, you know, doing the simulated account trading and all that stuff. But once I get into the real world, where I needed to know certain things that I didn't know because there wasn't nobody there to, to, to tell me that, all I'd been doing is listen to hundreds of these YouTube videos of these fools with their charts and their arrows and their diagrams and all that other crap. That it wasn't put together well. Nobody puts this stuff together well. Unless you've got a organizational background of which software engineering is the preeminent of that, project planning background is, is really good to have a project planning background, have a chemistry background, physics background, um, not so much math. Um, to show you that you need to look at these things and build these problem domains to limit the number of choices that you have. You say, well, Peter, you got a BS in physics, you harp about that, you got this math background, 40 years in real estate, and a 33 year career as a software engineer, and you lost $50,000, you must be a dumb fuck. No, I trusted that the folks that were out there doing this stuff, saying that they had made money trading Forex, that this was the way that you did it. Why would I doubt that? Because it's a sham. It's a charlatan thing. Anybody that's out there that's, that, that's, that's teaching stocks or options or, or, or Forex or commodities, 
it's very rare that they really know how to teach. Most of them probably are successful. A very few of them know how to teach that. And many of the ones that are successful um, have no clue as to how they got there. Most of them out there that are teaching have no clue. And that's why they charge you two or $3,000 to teach you trend line analysis, what a fucking head and shoulders pattern is, and, and stochastics, and fucking Bollinger Bands, and oh, my fucking word. Because they don't know how, how else to do it. And then there's a group out there that's really out to scam you. And I've run into some of those. This guy FX lifestyle and all this shit driving around a rented Lambo and I'm living the millionaire lifestyle and he's drinking his champagne by the pool. He's renting that thing by the, by the house by the hour. They did a survey on that guy. He, uh, they looked at his tax returns. He made $80,000 from selling courses. None of it from trading because he doesn't trade. He lies. And he's not the only one. You have some really sincere folks out there that come across as wonderful people. They're expert scam artists. Did you ever hear of Bernie Madoff? <laughs> he fooled some of the brightest people that were out there because they didn't want to do the work. If you don't want to do the work, it's far easier to listen to some of those guys than it is to listen to somebody like me. You know, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to give you the straight scoop. It's difficult because you actually have to fucking think about what I'm talking about. And if you do, it's a lot of fun. So, oh, that's something that I didn't know. I spent 40 years learning this stuff. The stuff some of this stuff works. It's valid. So try to try to put your resistance in in and I don't mean to be angry at uh, at you guys, you yeah, don't do your work. I do that with my karate student. You don't do your work, get the fuck out. You know? <laughs> because it's life or death. You don't listen to me, it could be your life. So sit down and, and shut up and listen to me. Well, I'm not going to do that on currency trading. I don't care. It's your money. You're gonna do what you want to do. I did what I thought was the right thing by watching all these videos and I'm a pretty bright guy. And lost fifty thousand dollars and when I finally did figure it out um, I took the remaining five thousand I had and I doubled that in four and a half or five months so oh, that's great if I break a rule then I lose money if I follow my rules I do fine and I'm not saying that I can take a five hundred thousand dollar account and double that in five months because it's different I say that every video and when I when I say well oh, I took an account and doubled it it's possible to do that but you sort of have to <laughs> have to know what you're doing. You have to be able to filter out the clutter that's out there. What's important? If you're interested in the countries that you're trading, which you should be, I mean, why trade Tibet and Mexico? There's not very much commerce between the two of them. And if you don't live in either one of them or your grandmother didn't, wasn't born there, what interest do you have? You gotta be interested in the, in the countries. And so as you go along, you learn a little bit about it. Geez, I wonder what the interest rate correlation or di differential is between these two countries. What, what's the economics? What's going on right now? What's, what's happening in the politics that's driving the economics of the country? Is one in a recession or going in a recession? Is one coming out? Are they both going in recessions? What are the, what are the interest rates doing? Is they're both going in a recession? What are both of their interest rates doing? You know, how is the stock market doing in comparison to the bond market? How's the how is the currencies reacting when their stock market goes up as opposed to when, when the stock market goes down? You don't have to know any of this stuff, but you get in and you start trading. You go, well, Jesus, I thought that, that the pound was supposed to go down against the dollar, but it went up. Why did it do that? Because the fucking line on the chart went up and you thought it was going to go down? Is that the rationale that you're going to have? Come on, you're all bright enough to know that that isn't the case. Something happened with the interest rates or something happened politically or, or something in one of the two countries. So what are you going to look at that's important? What's the problem domain? Are you concerned about what the price of wheat is or when their commodity markets are open 
or trading their stocks or uh, no you're, you're you're doing foreign currencies so you need to understand there's two countries you're going to limit that when you're when you're looking at your chart you should only be trading one currency pair not two or three if you're not going to be successful and find opportunities on one currency pair you're not going to find them on any multiple currency pairs trust me on that until you get more experience you get a couple of years of, of successful consistent trading and you can bring another currency pair in maybe when your currency pair goes offline maybe you'll go to a, a a, a currency pair that's that's online at that particular time so you can trade if you want to trade for eight hours a day or if you only trade at night and the majors are all done what what, what pair are you going to trade then you worry about that problem you don't worry about that problem now that's not the problem domain the problem domain how do I learn how to be a consistent trader consistently profitable trader and you learn that by eliminating as much of the clutter as you possibly can you know, you learn your basic entry theory and how to get out and all that other kind of crap. Start placing trades. As Jesse Livermore said, the only way to gain an education in the market is invest your cash, track your results, learn from your mistakes. So you, you, you thought the price was going to go up and it, it, it went down against you and you got bumped out. Okay, well, do that a few times and go, well, wait a minute, I thought. Well, you're obviously thinking wrong. What are you thinking wrong about? What factors could affect that, that change in price against what you thought it was? Well, it's probably something to do with interest rates, because that seems to be the major driver of what's going on. Well, you know, the interest rates have stayed the same. What are they talking about at the Federal Reserve level about what they're going to do with interest rates? Because just the breath of a change in interest rates will send the stock markets going crazy. So what are the markets doing? Um, what's the overall health of the economy? What's their manufacturing output? When's non-farm payroll? Do I want to trade non-farm payroll? You're not going to worry about that when you start. God, these people that teach this stuff, is just be, it, it just it boggles my mind. No wonder you all confused. I'm pretty smart. I was totally screwed when I got into it. Um, I, I'm sorry if my description of what a problem domain, you know, you didn't quite, quite get it. Google it, look it up, figure out what a problem domain is, and do some research on how you would build a problem domain of something that you're familiar with. Like I said, car registration, or, or maybe it's just baking a cake. What's the problem domain? And, and figure out then how to create that for the currency pair that you're, that, that you're trading in your Forex market. And, and see if you can't get to that next step. You know, you, you limit the information that you're dealing with so you don't have so many choices to make. And you find that you're making the wrong choice, but it's based on this information that you have. And you say, well, maybe I need a little bit more information. That's when you add that next piece of information. Maybe you need to understand what a resistance zone is, because that's what all the talking heads and YouTube are talking about, resistance zone. What is that? Well, not only do you have to hear what they're saying, but you've got to look at the economics behind it. Well, now you're going to study a little bit about order flow from institutional traders. You bring that into your problem domain, and so you expand, because if you've built a good foundation, a good framework for your problem domain, it should be extensible, and you can grow with it and gain knowledge, not just fill your head with useless information, but each time you put something in your head, Make it something that's important to know, not just something that's nice to know. The nice to know, you can learn tomorrow. Today, you need the what to know so that you don't complicate your lives. So that's defining the Forex problem domain. That's a process for it. It's an incomplete presentation of the material. I leave that to you to work on. And if you have any questions, throw me an email. Peter Rose, along with Currency Trading, have a great day and have a great trading day.